me, uh, I'm going to take a moment here and let's let's wade through some of this propaganda um, that we've all been subject to. And, and as we see with this withdrawal, we're watching recognizable characters uh, try to set the narrative for after Afghanistan. I think it's really important that we challenge what is being said here. So um, the first one that I'm going to play here, and uh, this comes from uh, General Petraeus, your your nemesis, uh, Matthew, and, and it should be all of our nemesis. Was there any version of the story that did not end with the Taliban back in charge? Certainly there was. There was a sustainable, sustained commitment that could have been pursued. Uh, 3,500 troops with a lot of drones and a lot of air power and 8,500 coalition forces, and perhaps most importantly, the contractors still on the ground to keep the Afghan Air Force flying. I think that it was really the psychological effect of our announcement of the withdrawal, then the actual withdrawal, and then very significantly, the withdrawal of the contractors that kept the U.S. provided helicopters and planes in the air and and showed the Afghan soldiers on the ground that there would be someone coming to the rescue uh, with resupplies, reinforcements, and indeed with close air support. And if soldiers on the ground don't think that that is coming, uh, then they're going to do what we have seen Afghan soldiers do. In the end, was there a lack of understanding of how deep corruption goes in that society and how it could affect the outcome? Well, there's no question that there has been very, very troubling corruption over the years. We created an anti-corruption uh, task force with the Afghans when I was the commander in Afghanistan. In general, I'm sure coming up through the officer ranks, you the, the lessons of Vietnam were hammered into your generation of officer. Are we at a point now that we've already forgotten those lessons? <clears throat> well, my Ph.D. dissertation, in fact, was on the impact of the lessons of Vietnam on uh, America's military leadership. Uh, Will you feel any sense of emptiness uh, when we mark the 20th anniversary of September 11th, based on what we've seen transpire in Afghanistan? It's a very interesting question, Lester, because I think I, I feel very differently about the prospect uh, of that anniversary uh, than I did, frankly, before the collapse in Afghanistan. Um. That's General David Petraeus, and uh, uh, we'll let you have a first crack at it, Matthew, and then we'll, we'll go to Anne. Uh, I'm reminded of the scene from Airplane when Lloyd Bridges <laughs> says, I picked the wrong week to stop sniffing glue. You know, um, just the lies, the, 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 the clinical um, pathological lying that goes on. I, I, I think this is a very serious serious thing. And, and I, I mean, not to, we, we shouldn't be making, I shouldn't be making light of it. Um, uh, you look, sociologists tell us that 4% of society are psychopaths. And we know that psychopaths do very well in institutions and organizations. And a man like David Petraeus is a psychopath. It, it, that's a clear, I mean, that's not hyperbole. I, I think if you were to, to look at who, what a psych, psych, psychopath is defined as, he meets that criteria for such a diagnosis. Um, I mean, it, it's very clear. And, and I think we have to accept that our system has been captured by psychopaths. And, and it has also been emboldened, which are who are emboldened by a corrupt media who, um, you know, says things that is just not just factually untrue, but it, like it's just it's just myth making. Um, you know, the, the comments made by Lester Holt about the corruption, just the, the, the way that the American media is so keen on pinning the blame on the Afghans. If the Afghans are a bunch of dirty rats who didn't deserve us to begin with, they're always just gonna steal from us. You know, I mean, in all the racist undertones that come from that, right? I mean, that's certainly, a, uh, you see that well throughout American history. Um, but, you know, it, it, neglecting the fact that we know that 80% of the money spent on reconstruction in Afghanistan, so 80%, at least 80% of the $150 billion or so the United States on spending, spent spending on, um, on reconstruction, on building up the Afghan army, et cetera, at least 80% of that made a round trip uh, back to the United States, either never left the United States or came back to the United States. So you talk about corruption, just it's so off base the way it's framed. Um, but I mean, and, and in Petraeus, the, the inconvenient leaving out of things, the, the look, the Afghan soldiers hadn't been paid for six months or so. They hadn't had food for two months. Um, 
The uh, Afghan government workers hadn't been paid in six months. The United States is spending $900 million a year, supposedly, on Afghan government salaries, including this year. Where did that money go to? It went to the very men. Well, it went to the corporation, the American corporations and everything, of course. But at, in Afghanistan, it went to the very men that David Petraeus said were the men that we could tr trust, were the men that Petraeus pal around with, were the men that, that Petraeus sent young Americans to kill and be killed for in order to keep in power. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 you know, you look at the fact that David Petraeus failed over and over and over again. And, you know, just to, to, just to, to stick on Petraeus for one more moment and I'll, I'll let Lan and comment. Remember, Petraeus in 2003 had command of, of the city of Mosul in Iraq with the 101st uh, uh, Air Assault Division. And um, when, according to Petraeus and his people in Mosul, everything was going pretty well in Mosul in 03 into 04. And then when the unit that came in replaced uh, Petraeus, it was a nightmare. I mean, they just walked into a shit show. It was just violent. And, and reality was is that Petraeus and his people were cooking the books. And this is well documented, right? Uh, Petraeus then takes over the training command in, in Iraq, what was called Minstiki, which was responsible for building up the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army. Um, under his command, the, that training command loses 300,000 rifles and pistols. Hundreds of thousands of rifles and pistols just go missing under Petraeus's command in Iraq. Same time, too, this is when the Shia militias start to really fill out, particularly the Iraqi police, and become those death squads that really uh, precipitate uh, and foment and, and, and are catalysts or, 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 or accelerate the uh, genocidal civil war that is occurring in Iraq. That's under Petraeus's watch. But then you also have to, or under Petraeus's command, but then you also have to remember October 2004, Petraeus writes an op-ed, uh, either in the Post or the New York Times, I forget which, and, and Petraeus basically endorses George Bush for president. Doesn't mention him by name, but you can't go back and read that op-ed without understanding it as an endorsement by the most famous general in America, because you have to remember at this point, Petraeus has been on the cover of Newsweek a couple of times. At one point, he is uh, it, the cover says, is this the man who can save Iraq? Uh, you know, I mean, he has he is a he is a celebrity general. He is easily the most recognizable and trusted general in the United States since Colin Powell and Norman Schwarzkopf, arguably the most impactful general since uh, Westmoreland in Vietnam. Um, and he writes this op ed endorsing George Bush. And right in any sane system, in any system that would have any integrity that actually valued civilian control of the military, a nonpartisan, nonpolitical military, Petraeus would have been fired, court martialed most likely. But what happens? Petraeus gets promoted, and then he gets promoted again, then he gets promoted again, right? Ultimately culminating to becoming director of central intelligence, where of course the Paula Broadway affair, affair happens. If people are not familiar with that, Petraeus was sleeping with his biographer. And as director of central intelligence, he was passing along top secret information to Paula Broadwell, including ongoing operations the CIA was conducting, the military was conducting in order to, one, either help fill out his biography or impress her. Um, and he was, of course, you know, let off with a slap on the wrist. But I think that you have to understand that. And then if you understand that that's who rises to the top. Well, people like that pull people like themselves up below them, up behind them, as well as people who want to rise understand this is how I have to act to rise up. So, you know, long explanation of this. But, yeah, I, I think you knew, Kevin, that if you play a, a clip of Petraeus, you were going to get me agitated and all wound up. So well done. <laughs> all right. And what would you like to add? Well, I think Matt has uh, pretty well covered it, but, you know, the, it wasn't like everybody in America agreed uh, and, and didn't see through him. I can remember being thrown out of a congressional hearing as we had the banners that said, not Petraeus, but betray us. And that's, we all knew that. I mean, we, we knew it, uh, but the, as Matt said, the mainstream media was just going uh, bonkers for this uh, latest hero that they could... Uh, uh, they could spell, sell lots of magazines about. Uh, we also know that, uh, you know, by that time, we knew that uh, senior officials of Afghanistan had uh, tremendous uh, properties that were in Dubai and uh, Doha. Uh, we knew that uh, U.S. contractors were making a killing out of this. And the, the wealth that was returning, as Matt said, returning to the U.S. in these uh, 
sole source um, contracts that were being issued by the military. In fact, one very, very courageous woman, Benetine Greenhouse, uh, was the chief of army um, uh, contracting, and she ended up getting essentially fired because she kept raising the issue of how come I'm being ordered to give sole source contracts to groups like Halliburton, which Vice President Cheney had just come from, and all of the graft and corruption. So it was out there. Uh, people were reporting on it, but it was allowed to continue because that's just the way it was. Hello, everyone. Hope you're enjoying this week's episode of the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast. Here is a reminder to support our show and help us keep going. You can go to Patreon or Rockfin or Spotify to support our show. So here's the links. If you want to support us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash unauthorized disclosure. If you want to support us on Rockfin and become a subscriber of our channel, go to rockfin.com slash unauthorized dis. If you'd like to support us on Spotify, pull up our show, the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast, and subscribe to our paid content. On all three spaces, you get access to full episodes and any other additional exclusive content we post every month. So thank you and back to the show. So uh, that's, the, that's the general, that's uh, someone who has uh, complicity and also responsibility, but hasn't been held accountable at all for any of what's gone on in the war. Now uh, let's look at someone who is in a, a think tank, um, because these people populate our, our screens <laughs> and um, infect our understanding. Um, and let's- uh, you're, you're, killing is... me. you're killing me, Kevin. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think this gives people like the complete picture of, of who we have to deal with um, because they're, they're, they're the ones who are writing the dominant narrative of this conflict and Unfortunately, we have our work cut out for us because we're going to spend the next um, decades tr trying to unravel what they say. But here's Richard Haas, um, and he's at the Council on Foreign Relations. And, um, and of course, to make it even more obnoxious, we have um, the, the pairing of Joe Scarborough. What are the ramifications for this country as we move forward in the future uh, for other countries uh, who, who we try to, you know, try to get to come out and take a chance on democracy, take a chance on freedom, or at least take a chance on basic human rights and, 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 and take a chance on us, believing that we'll stay there and fight and, and, and defend them. I think what this does is it reinforces the growing narrative that the United States is not a steady, predictable, reliable hand. We saw it with Barack Obama after the, the red line fiasco in Syria, uh, the intervention in Libya, and then no follow-up. We then many things in the Trump administration where he targeted U.S. allies in all sorts of uh, ways, U.S. troop presence that had been there for generations was suddenly a big question mark over it. Uh, you mentioned the situation in, in Syria, uh, now this. So again, I, I don't think Germans are going to wake up tomorrow and say American troops are going to leave, even though Donald Trump wanted to, or South Koreans. But I do think it raises questions about reliability, and I, two things are likely. One is our friends begin to hedge uh, because American support is simply less certain. And uh, what worries me also is some of our adversaries might think that maybe the United States is not as dependable. Maybe now's the time to press. Maybe now's the time to explore what we can get away with, because this is clearly an America that's totally focused uh, domestically. And that clearly seems to have very little interest in maintaining a kind of a large world role or even a medium sized world role uh, for, for much longer. So uh, it, it, it feeds a narrative. And that's what that that's what concerns me. One other... <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we will start with Anne for this one. Well, Richard Haas and I have a little bit of a background when I resigned. Well, before I resigned in 2003, uh, I wrote uh, a dissent cable uh, to the State Department, laying out all my views. Essentially, it was uh, uh, the predecessor to my resignation letter, but laying out all of my uh, problems with what the Bush administration was doing uh, leading up to a, a war on Iraq uh, and also other foreign policy 
concerns that I had, including, uh, you know, essentially icing out North Korea, uh, where we did have some contacts and could have uh, kept talking with them about a potential their their nuclear uh, research program, and also you know the curtailment of civil liberties, all of that. Well, so my descent cable came to Washington, and it was Richard Haas who was the head of uh, he was the director of policy planning which is the group that will respond to uh, people out in the field that uh, are saying, you guys in Washington don't know what you're doing, and, and here's my idea of what we ought to do. Like, don't invade Iraq, an oil-rich Arab Muslim country that had not attacked the United States, had nothing to do with 9-11, so don't do it. So here came back from Richard Haas, this paltry little thing of, well, we know better, and uh, all you have to do is read our press releases every day, and that will give us give you the uh, background on why we uh, we know what we're doing. It wasn't until several years later, like probably after 2008, when uh, the Bush administration was out of power, that Richard Haas finally said, uh, perhaps we were incorrect in our analysis of Iraq. Well, Richard Haas has been incorrect on a lot of things, but he gets paid a lot. He's got a big name, and these think tanks just keep uh, uh, hiring uh, these people that have been wrong in their assessments and virtually never uh, giving voice to people like Matt Ho, uh, who has been correct on these things. <laughs> yeah, the think tanks, well, first, let's go back to what Haas says. And again, another liar, another person who, who builds their argument upon lies, lies which they know they are, they are arguing uh, for. You know, just, just take the red, that he talks about Obama not, Obama allowing Syria to get away with crossing the red line of chemical weapons. Well, I mean, Barack Obama himself said that there was not enough evidence uh, to justify military strikes in Syria, that that the, the United States intelligence community could not confirm that Assad uh, launched, this, launched that chemical attack. Uh, and this, of course, has been confirmed again, right, by uh, journalist accounts, as well as, uh, you know, the leaks from the OPCW whistleblowers. But, you know, Barack Obama says this. James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, confirms it. Obama says this in, a, in an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg uh, in The Atlantic. I mean, so not not a uh, an opposition or adversarial uh, uh, establishment, uh, you know, not not um, excuse, me, excuse me, not adversarial to the establishment at all. The Atlantic, you know, and Haas just chooses to ignore all that, you know, and Scarborough is an idiot. So he's not going to know anything different. And he's surrounded by sycophants. I mean, like, I think we have to because. We are at the end of 20 years of people being massacred, the, sl the slaughter, the destruction. I think we have to use words that are very firm in describing these people. Ghost Scarborough is an idiot. I mean, he is. I mean, that's, you know, maybe I could choose my words better. But in terms of someone who speaks without knowing what they're talking about, that is exactly what Scarborough is. Um, the think tanks are very dangerous. They're very well funded. There's a cyclical relationship uh, with Congress, the Pentagon, uh, and the, the think tanks. Uh, the Congress appropriates money to the Pentagon um, and to the State Department, the CIA, and, and other organizations. Uh, those, uh, the bulk of that money goes out to arms companies, development companies, intelligence contractors, whatever. Those people, those companies and contractors, then fund these think tanks. A lot of these think tanks are also funded directly by uh, the United States government, by the Pentagon, by the State Department, by the National Security Council, etc. These think tanks are also funded by uh, foreign governments. Um, and let me tell you, as, as a, a disabled combat veteran who, you know, realized who, who got the guts too late to stand up against these wars, but um, who understands them, there's nothing, there's, it, it's, it's, it's hard to articulate what it feels like when some, because I, 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 I'm around these people. Uh, what one of when, when someone from a, a think tank that's funded by foreign governments and by weapons companies says to me, thank you for your service. It's really hard to articulate what that makes me feel. Um, but you have to understand how well funded these think tanks are. Um, you know, they, they, they break down, they support various elements uh, within the various factions of the empire. So you have like, say, supporting the neoconservatives or the GOP neoconservatives. You have the Institute for Study of War uh, supporting like the liberal interventionists within the Obama administration and Biden administration. You have the Center for New American Security supporting like the, the Trump generals you know, Mattis, Kelly, Mc, uh, McMaster, those types, you have uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracy. Uh, Foundation for De Defense of Democracy, which uh, the last numbers I've seen for it, 2019, had $32 million in funding. 
for a think tank of what, a dozen, two dozen people, $32 million. I mean, so they're very capable, they're very well resourced, and they have access. I met with, meeting with um, uh, Senator Bob Casey's staff in 2012, I was told by one of his staffers, who actually was a military officer, a U.S. Army major, that seven out of 10 briefings that the Senate Armed Services Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee received do not come from U.S. government organizations or agencies like the CIA or the State Department or the Pentagon, but rather seven out of 10 briefings that they receive come from think tanks like Foundation for Defense of Democracy, Institute of Study of War, um, uh, you know, uh, CNAS. Uh, so these are very important um, and they're very integral to uh, the continuance of these wars uh, at all levels, right? Funding, operations, uh, narrative, propaganda, public support, political support, et cetera. And so uh, that's the think tanker um, who's polluting our understanding. The last one, I promise, there's no more clips, Matt. I'm sorry that I did this <laughs> to you. Um, but this is... Um, this is uh, the journalist. Um, well, we have to get the, we have to work in um, someone who uh, I, I guess uh, I, I mock him by saying I offer my condolences for the loss of his war, um, as did several other people. But this is um, a Richard Engel um, of NBC. Uh, um, Richard Engel, your thoughts to what you just heard from General McKenzie announcing the end of the 20 year war in Afghanistan. Well, these are heavy days. I don't know any way other uh, other to describe it. I do not envy him for having had to make that statement to speak to the American people, but also to speak to others who served in Afghanistan, including his own family members, and to tell them that we came, we fought and we're leaving and we're handing over the country back to the same enemy, and that we coordinated with the enemy so that they could make sure we packed up and left on time. It is a, a moment of deep humility. The, the United States has been humbled today. It is another empire that has not fallen in Afghanistan, but that has stumbled in Afghanistan. The British Empire fought in Afghanistan and pulled out in defeat as did the Soviet Union, and now the United States as well. Mission. There hadn't been mm -hmm. any troops killed in Afghanistan in about two years, and the costs had been reduced significantly. There was about 3,500 troops there that were holding it together who weren't dying, and with their withdrawal, you saw quickly the collapse of, of the entire country. There's going to be a lot of debate whether that was the right decision. Most Afghans do not think it was the right decision. Most Afghans never saw the, those American troops, did not feel occupied by those American troops, felt comforted by their presence. And their withdrawal emboldened the Taliban, as did the deal signed by, by President Trump. Uh, what a fraud. I mean, what an absolute fraud. Again, another person who just simply does not know what they're talking about. I mean, I, um, you know, the idea that the United States did not feel the occupation as if this war was somehow not affecting Afghans, was not a continuance of 40 years of warfare, was not devastating them, that somehow this war hadn't just completely destroyed the country where 90% of the population lives on less than $2 a day, which is the uh, po with poverty rate for Afghanistan. And actually 70% of the population lives on less than a dollar a day, where Afghanistan is the second most food insecure country in the world. And even before the Taliban took over, the country was on the brink of starvation and was in economic collapse, not on the verge of economic collapse. And somehow Richard Engel states that the pop, the people didn't feel the occupation, let alone the violence, the slaughter. The, 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 I mean, it's just it boggles the mind that he could say something like that. I mean, it, it is it is just absolutely fraudulent. Um, I think NBC and CNN have been among the worst in terms of their coverage. Uh, CNN with uh, you know, com contrast uh, closer Ward's coverage on CNN with Charlotte Bell's coverage on Al Jazeera. And if you do that, if, if you look literally at, at the reporting they made at the same time from the same place, Kabul, um, you will see, you will truly understand what um, the, the concept of manufacturing consent actually means. Because these, uh, these American media networks did nothing but sustain narrative and propaganda. You know, as well as, again, just be completely wrong. 
Um, the reason why no American troops died in the last 18 months, because there was a peace deal with the Taliban. Like, wh wh what don't they get about that? Why do they choose to ignore that? You know, the only either they're too dumb, Kevin, or they're in on it. Because because how can you say no Americans died in the last 18 months without saying it was because of a negotiated deal with the Taliban? The only way you could say that is either because you're too dumb to know that or the fact that you're in on it and you want to continue this war because for whatever reason, again, Richard Engel is another one of these psychopaths who thinks that blood is better, who thinks that violence is better, who thinks that, you know, it doesn't matter if, 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 if and this feeds into the whole, na whole structure of how American warfare has evolved over particularly these last 10 years since the Obama administration, where these wars are hidden. Where as long as it's just black people killing black people, brown people killing black, brown people, it doesn't matter to the American public, doesn't matter to the American Congress, and obviously doesn't matter to the American media, or at least it doesn't matter to NBC News, because these are just brown people killing brown people. They've always been killing each other. What are you going to do with these savages? I mean, that's the literal, that's the attitude you get from that. And, and that is the actual, um, I mean, that is the consequences of these policies and the fact that you have a media that is complicit with these, uh, 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 you know, war policies. Ann, anything you'd like yeah, to add? Well, if I could add, well, you could see uh, Richard Engel almost crying uh, about the end of his uh, war career. Uh, you know, the, so many correspondents have uh, made a name for themselves of, of uh, being the reporters on the ground. That's the way we get introduced to them, like Christiane Amanpour in the Gulf War One. Uh, that's where she got her start. And so the, the fact that these uh, reporters really w want a war because that's where they can get uh, international recognition, uh, where they can uh, uh, go and be in danger and, uh, you know, their voices are heard throughout the world, whereas covering the economic conditions of uh, Belgium uh, you know, that doesn't really ring so strongly <laughs> with networks and and uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, make your name for yourself. So uh, the, the war reporters uh, are, I would think, uh, pretty sad when they see yet one more of the um, uh, mistakes of the United States coming to an end. However, I would say to them uh, that, uh, you know, the U.S. probably has not learned its lesson and that there will be other uh, tragedies that the U.S. military will be getting into because the politicians think that war is the answer and that military operations are much better uh, than diplomacy. So these war correspondents are, um, uh, you know, a, a fact that uh, uh, really should be, you know, the, the American public got to take a deep breath and say, why are they reporting the way it is? And let's do get get some other information. Like uh, on my computer every day, I've got three or four different news outlets that are ready to roll so I can just do the live streaming. And whether it's uh, Al Jazeera or whether it's Russia Today, which I do watch for sure, uh, uh, or, you know, of course, Democracy Now! that has uh, good coverage and uh, of things. But we can't rely on our, on our networks because they are complicit uh, with our government and how uh, wars are portrayed to the American public and to the world. Hey everyone, hope you enjoyed this clip of the Unauthorized Disclosure podcast. Here's a reminder of all the ways you can support our show and help us keep going. If you're able to help out, you'll get access to full episodes of the Unauthorized Disclosure show. So here they are. Go to patreon.com slash unauthorized disclosure or rockfin.com slash unauthorized dis and we're also up on spotify where you can pay uh, and subscribe to the full episodes of unauthorized disclosure uh, thank you and we'll be back soon with more unauthorized disclosure